have a wonderful electronic invention I want you to see. It, it looks something like this. The Veracity Podcast. Discovery Sessions. What's up, Vancouver Island? Thank you for tuning into the Veracity Podcast. This is your co-host, Brett Jameson, and today I'm speaking with Kieran Cox. He's a PhD candidate and Hakai scholar at the University of Victoria, who's broadly interested in topics relating to marine biodiversity and how ecological communities respond to change in coastal conditions. He's done work on topics relating to traditional and contemporary shellfish cultivation, deteriorating coral reef ecosystems, and he's interested in understanding how marine species respond to human-related impacts, including aquatic noise and microplastics. On today's episode, we discuss a variety of topics related to marine science, including the fascinating ecosystems of coastal British Columbia, communicating science to the general public, and issues pertaining to the state of the modern ocean. I'm super excited about this conversation with Kieran, and I hope you all feel the same way. Thanks for listening. So I'm sitting here with Kieran Cox. He is a rock star PhD student and resident heartthrob at the University of Victoria. Yeah. Ten years running. Yeah. <laughs> thanks. Uh, thanks for coming in to chat with us today, man. I know you're a busy guy. So. Yeah. Yeah. No problem. Great to be here. Cheers. So uh, maybe you can give us just a brief background, um, sort of where, where you come from and, and what brought you into the field of marine biology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm from the interior. So I'm from Summerland, British Columbia, which is a pretty rad little place, uh, but it's not a good place to go through your 20s in. So I got out and actually it was kind of around that era um, that I got interested in diving and marine ecology in general, but I was kind of this jockey s small town guy. And so the island is where I decided to head as it seemed kind of the right way forwards. Did my degree here, uh, took a year off, worked kind of abroad and then around the university as well. And then now I've started my PhD, which is funded by the Hakai Institute as well as NSERC. And it's been just kind of this whirlwind of marine ecology. And so, yeah, this is where I find myself. So the town that you're from, is that interior BC or are you coastal? I'm interior, yeah. So I'm from the Okanagan. So it's small, oh, it's a re relatively big lake as far as lakes go. But yeah, really small town, 10,000 people, 100 people grad class kind of scenario. Right. So yeah. how did you get into diving then? being kind of separated spatially from the ocean and the coastline? Yeah, so I got really, really lucky in all reality. Um, being a small town athlete, I think it's kind of an interesting scenario in that you're pushed in a lot of different directions and they're maybe not very realistic. And so I was lucky in that my dad's a sports psychologist and so I didn't really have any misnomers for what Canadian athletics looks like. And so we had this really good chat and you know, it was like, you know, if you're gonna go to university, you don't really want to waste that experience on, you know, kind of like a has been, could be basketball career. And so I decided to go abroad because that option wasn't going to go anywhere anytime quickly. And so I went through Southeast Asia, kind of the very stereotypical, uh, you know, going to find myself and whatnot, uh, 19, 20 year old kid, found myself in Cambodia and started diving in this little squid village and just stayed for about a month, month and a half. Um, really cool opportunity though. You know, you're living on a house made of driftwood uh, over the ocean with, you know, a lot of like local Khmer's, really small dive shop. Um, they ultimately started Marine Conservation Cambodia, which was kind of just a whisper when we were there. And yeah, it was that really just kicked it all off. Um, you know, you can't really make a lot of money in diving. It was new. It was something I knew I wanted to pursue. But when you talk to divers and, you know, you work in the industry a bit, it becomes pretty clear that, you know, study is the best way forwards for if you want any kind of stability. So uh, honestly, UVic is, you know, it's a place to be in Canada, I would say, if you want to dive. Uh, my dad being a professor, I could have gone to SFU and I would have had free tuition, which is not trivial. Um, but if you Google dive sites, Vancouver, there's not that many and Victoria is really the place to be. So I made the decision after a year, but a year and a half of college, uh, in the interior to come here. And yeah, that really started it off for me. So it was diving specifically that brought you out to the Island as opposed to somewhere, you know, closer to Vancouver with free tuition. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So the, the diving here is phenomenal. Um, and it really, it's more accessible at the undergraduate level than I would argue it is in most places in Canada. Um, you know, diving in Vancouver is very good, but unless you have a car and the means to do these kind of things, it's really difficult. And so 
you know, you've got whatever it is, 20 dive sites within a half an hour of the university. It's pretty clear uh, where you want to be if you're that kind of person. And for me, that was really it. I mean, I don't think I started paying attention to school until well into the second or third year of my classes. It was really all diving motivated. I think I did, I mean, I did 400 dives in my undergraduate. Um, you know, it was just, you know, semesters would be 50 dives at a time some, some of the years. So it's really the way forwards. I don't know if you had the, the same experience. Like, I mean, do you, do you have an idea or can you recall when your interest in marine science was peaked? I mean, I'm, I'm from Saskatchewan. And so I mean, reminiscing on growing up, like the ocean was always this like far distant, mysterious place with a lot of intrigue. And I like every time that I would ever make it close, like even if it was SeaWorld in San Diego, it was just like over the moon being there and, and immersed in, in like the realm of the ocean. And and I think I think that was kind of the, the main draw for me going out there. Are you able to pinpoint like where you where you found your interest? Did, did diving come first? Was it sort of an adventure thing that, that happened and then you, you sort of found the interest afterwards or was your forays into diving a result of... of yeah, no, so it was more, um, it was, was 100% luck in a lot of ways. So I grew up on the lake and I think when you're young, you probably don't uh, discern the difference between an ocean-based life and a lake-based life in a lot of ways. You more just kind of develop uh, interactions with water in general. But really I was you know, a very stereotypical 19 year old bro in Cambodia. And, you know, we went on this snorkel tour and it was great. And my twin, I have a twin brother. Uh, and so we were there together, uh, with a group of friends and well, people we'd met along the way more like, and so we decided, you know, we talked to this guy and said, look, you should try diving. It'd be really great. This Island was really, really something special. So we wanted to find a way to get there for a longer period of time. And they said, you know, do your open water class. You can make it last a week. And we did. And I remember like very distinctly being in this uh, underwater in this little squid village, like under this dock. And I saw a cuttlefish, which is like kind of an odd creature for someone who has no idea what they're doing. It's, you know, <laughs> really it is. It's like, you know, you're seeing it's strange looking. Yeah. If you don't know alien. they exist. It's basically alien life as far as most people for are sure. concerned. And so I saw this thing and they do this really interesting feeding behavior where they like go really slow and then shoot out and then they can like bolt away if you startle them. So I had no idea what this thing was and I figured it out and I think that was really it. Um, we ultimately did a couple more courses and stayed on this island for about a month and a half and that was really where I cultivated it. And I mean like I didn't even take bio in high school. Like I came back, that's why I ultimately went to college was I came back and I had taken no sciences. I was gonna go into human kinetics. I was already enrolled in a human kinetics program. So I kind of juggled that with getting the credits I needed to get into the science program. And so literally, you know, it was diving that caused a fundamental shift in the way I interact with the world, my courses, now my career, um, you know, and who knows where I would be if I didn't have that kind of an experience. Right. Sounds like we had a pretty similar sort of introduction or, or, or road to marine science. And that like, I, when I first entered university, I was in pre-police studies in the faculty of arts at the university of Regina. And I was going to school because my parents were essentially like, well, you, you pay rent or you go to school. And it was like, well, I don't have any money. So I guess I'll go to school. And, um, yeah, but, and, but I also like always had this interest in the ocean. And so it, like, like you said, you don't really make the connection that like, oh, it's like something that you could do I don't know, as, as a living or a vocation until, until you start to like get immersed in the realm and, and start exploring, you know, diving and, and just and being involved with people that are doing science. And did you make a similar transition? So what happened with police studies? I started in pre-police studies and then like immediately once I was in there, well, I thought maybe I would go into forensics. Yeah. Like going to forensics and cause I, I did have in high school, I did take biology and, and had an interest in biological sciences. And so, um, and so that was like the path. And I, to my understanding, you had to spend time as like a constable and have some experience with the law. And so, uh, but as soon as I started classes, I started taking like philosophy and just general natural sciences, physics, chemistry, biology. And then, um, and then like immediately after that, that semester, I transferred into the faculty of biology prior to actually shipping out East to Dalhousie, which is where I did my undergrad. Um, and that's sort of, that was the snowball that was just kind of like, oh yeah, well, this is, this is definitely what I want to do for, for a living. And yeah, and something that I want to pursue. 
Yeah, so very similar. Yeah, very yeah, similar. super similar. Yeah, it's nice when you, when people have that kind of flexibility. I think a lot of people, especially the undergraduate level, you kind of move through with a cohort, and it's really hard to change that direction once you started. Which is especially true if you've taken large amounts of student loans and you're kind of you know weren't sure why you were there initially. You basically just choose you know oh what was I interested in in high school right, and it's like you're asking a 17 year old what they're interested in as if it's going to like set up the rest of their life. It's such a, such an odd fallacy. Yeah, absolutely. In hindsight, I would have taken a gap year for sure, but mm-hmm. yeah, I just didn't have, didn't have the foresight to, to make that decision in the time. But, um, yeah. So do you, where, where was your first or what was your first transition from sort of like diving as a recreational activity into the actual science, um, side of things? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it kind of happened pretty organically. So when I was here, the university is a great scuba club, like seriously shout out to the scuba club. They're awesome. And I think they're really good for undergraduates looking to develop their skills. We are in a pretty rugged piece of coastline. There's a lot of things you need to be aware of. And so that was a really good transitional period for me. And so I did my dive master here, which was great. I spent, you know, like eight months just bombing around the coast, going on awesome dives. And when I finished, I not even actually before I'd finished, I started applying for these like pretty, uh, you know, out there jobs, uh, just kind of this like young, super keen. I got to dive all summer now kind of uh, thought process. And so I applied for this job that I was nowhere near qualified for. Like I did not have a Ph.D. I don't speak Spanish. <laughs> uh, there was a series of reasons why. I shouldn't have got the job and I got an email back and it was like, hey, you don't have a PhD, you don't speak Spanish. And I was like, good, we're on the same page. <laughs> uh, they were like, but you have a dive master and, uh, you know, I'm you're definitely not getting the job you applied for, but I'm, you know, I'm looking for dive masters for this summer. And uh, do you want to come to Honduras with us? And it was with this organization, Operation Alicia. And they just kind of run this uh, citizen soft science kind of program, but then they also have more of a research component to them. So if you were, say, a master's student in the UK and you needed a field site to do your research, you can't set up said field site. It's too expensive. There's too many logistics. There's in-country permitting that needs to be done. And so you might approach somewhere like Opwall and say, okay, I'm going to send one of my students out and they're going to stay there for the summer. This is the project. And so these kind of systems need a lot of dive support. And so I Googled where I would be going. It was Cayos Cachinos in Honduras. And Honduras is really well known for the Bay Islands, which is like Roatan and Utila, which are these like pretty aggressive party islands. uh, And they're, you know, generally a good time for diving. Cayos is the closer to the coastline uh, island. And there's actually two islands there. And it's in a marine protected area. You can't go there uh, without this kind of permitting. And so I was like, okay, no other chance to go to this island basically ever unless I say yes right now. Sounds great. Uh, So I signed up and I got on a plane and I went to Honduras for like six weeks um, and just kind of played this dive master science S role there. And it was awesome. Like it was, you know, it was everything you kind of want at that stage in your development, like tropical island, great people. You know, you're drinking like Caribbean rum one night a week with everybody, but like everybody's very focused, lots of legitimate science being done. It's like 75 cent pints. Yeah. It's a, well, ma- it's a magical place. Right? Yeah, yeah. Where you're like, <laughs> you know, you're getting like, you know, like the locals in those countries are always awesome, right? They're so fun to hang out with, especially in that kind of setting where they're, you know, they're working a lot with Opwall. And so it's like really facilitates these nice interactions. It's not just kind of a tourist grind where people are going and spending their money. And that's the kind of exchange they're working with the locals for questions they'd like to see addressed. Obviously, they have issues, you know, surrounding uh, something like turtle numbers and poaching and these kind of things. And so, yeah, so you can more like, you know, you can get you find some local friend that'll buy you some bottle of rum for 20 bucks and bring it onto the island. And yeah, so it was it was really great. And that was kind of my first dose into it. Um, And that took my summer. Yeah, more or less. So did you start in coral reef ecology then? Is that sort of Mm -hmm. your, your intro? Yeah, that's kind of my base. So because I started in Cambodia, that's all coral reef. Um, and then came back here and did a lot of cold diving and then went back to the corals and then through Opwall as well. The next summer, uh, I got asked if I wanted to come back to Honduras. Opwall's got, you know, they're in at least 10 countries with like 20 something field sites. And so, you know, I was like, well, I'd love to go back to Honduras. It was great, but you also have a base in Indonesia and that's where I'd really like to go. So the next summer I did two months and I went to Wakatobi, which is one of like the far corners of Indonesia beautiful place it's they've got a unesco world heritage site designation to them 
And so, yeah, another two months with them there. So I've done a lot of coral diving as well. Yeah. Um, and it's all been very beautiful. Yeah. Is that is that in the ballpark of like Raja Ampat? The Kind of, yeah. yeah not yeah, okay. super close. Okay. So I've been to Indonesia three times now. And so the same summer I went to Honduras, I won a scholarship. And obviously the right thing to do with a scholarship is spend it on diving. And so I went to Indonesia as well that summer. And so we went to the Lembe Strait, which is this like rad little bit of coastline that is probably the ugliest coral reef in the world. Uh, it's called muck diving. So it's like black volcano sand and it's where like all the weird of the weird live. Like the critters that like basically, I think anyways, and I wrote a really funny little paper on this, but like I think it's all the critters that make their living in a kind of like alternative way, you could say. So these would be like the frogfish that sit still for like, three days straight and fishes with us uh, more or less an antennae on the top of its head until something comes along trying to eat said you know fishing lure and then it eats it right these kind of really weird species these mimic octopus that pretend to be sea crates or you know flat fish and move around their environment and so it's really i mean it's a phenomenal place to go diving um you're just seeing everything you see blows your mind especially as a biologist you're just like that is a completely odd life history what are you doing in the world like <laughs> yeah, my god and then you look it? over and there's another thing and you're just i don't even yeah. know what that is and then you like figure it out and yeah so i did a lot of diving there and then another trip uh i went back to lembe and i went to raja Ampet as well that would have been like maybe a year ago or so right that's so been I, on the top of my list for like it's, years yeah, yeah it's incredible i just have no like excuse to even be in that part of the world at this current yeah. point in time so yeah maybe yeah and it's day. not cheap i i all of my trips to indonesia raja had been the top of my list and it just was finally i was like okay i have to go to raja Ampet now like i can't go back to indonesia and not go and it's incredible i mean you're talking you're talking the most biodiverse region in the world uh, from a coral reef standpoint. So you do dives where you're seeing, you know, upwards of 500 species of fish, 600 species of fish. There's 700 species of coral, 1500 species of fish in the region in general. It's just incredible. And, you know, to its credit, it's in really good shape. Like yeah, absolutely. reefs right now are pretty rough and Raja is not been hit by the same it seems to be doing well. Yeah. yeah. If I correct me if I'm wrong, but is that general region is kind of the hypothesized point of origin for just coral species or reef building corals in general and they kind of radiated outwards so yeah. it makes sense that you your diversity would be super high that you'd have a bunch of super number one endemic species but just yeah crazy stuff to see underwater yeah totally yeah so I, yeah I, it's kind of like the birthplace of biodiversity yeah. marine wine anyways uh would be the idea um and you're totally right it's it's really incredible it's been able to retain a lot of that i kind of feel from a conservation standpoint it's really interesting because it has a very much like the final frontier feel to it for biodiversity as well. We know biodiversity globally is not in great shape. And so when you go there, you kind of get this feeling of like, you know, this could be where a major argument is mounted for truly trying to protect some of these species. You know, if you protect a single reef in Raja, you could protect 20 reefs in the Caribbean and you wouldn't even get half of that biodiversity. Yeah. You wouldn't get a seventh of it. For sure. You know, so that's a complex objective, though, especially when you're talking about corals and reefs and, and, and you know, stressors and like along the line of temperature change. Right. That can cause massive damage to a reef system. And like, how do you, you know, how do you mitigate that kind of effect mm -hmm. um, in a system when? Uh, yeah. When the influence and the, uh, the, the inputs are, are much broader in scope. Yeah, it is. It is tough. The thing with Raja that I think would be the first step really with any system, this is true, is that you need a very intact system to stand any chance of being resilient to your change. And so if you go in and you selectively pull out top predators or you have some invasive species come in or any of these kind of things, you make that system less stable. And this is one of the things that Raja really has going for it is that it's one of the few places you still see all the trophic levels, which as a diver is really interesting to see, you know, sharks schooling or sharks uh, swimming above and the rest of the reef kind of get in line accordingly. And then you have this really diverse coral system. And so, you know, as one coral bleaches, let's say another one can take its place or there's still kind of this arms race going on. And so for Raja, I think the thing they should really be thinking about is like they have this incredible tourist resource, best reefs in the world, are well known now because we have the internet. So when someone goes to go on a dive vacation, they Google, and I did this as well, best reefs in the world, Raja Ampet. Okay, that's where I'm headed. And so, you know, you can think if you can 
you can basically, if that's the mentality of the world, you can set any conservation standard you want and people will still show up, i.e. the locals will still make money, the Indonesian government will still make money. Like when you pay park access fees to there, I don't hesitate. I'm like double it, triple sure. it, I don't care. Yeah. You know, like I'm paying for this reason to come here. And unfortunately, there's enough examples where people haven't conserved these resources and then the tourists will just go elsewhere. Yeah. Right. I think especially with reefs in decline everywhere and, and just like looking at a system like that and you I mean you charge charge whatever you want and people are gonna want to see it and they're gonna come and they're gonna flock to see it. It's like it's like the mecca of scuba diving or the mecca of reef systems. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Sibidan has done this. So Sibidan has a really strict permitting system where you can basically get in like one day a week of a uh, your dive charter nearby Sipidan will go to Sipidan because of the permitting. Where's Sipidan? Uh, so it's in it. It's basically like Malaysia Borneo kind of area, um, and so people still go here, right? It's a pain in the butt to go to. You might only go for a day if you stay for a week, and yet people go because they've set this really high standard. As a result, their system is still re relatively healthy, and so they've done a really good job. And I think Raja could do something similar where you might as well set that standard because the tourists will come in waves, but when the reef is destroyed, they will leave. And yeah. then you have these kind of systems where, you know, now your local economy collapses and that's not good for anyone. It seems to be, a, to me, a concept that's suitable to export really anywhere and, and within Canada and our own conservation in initiatives, right? Like if you, if you, you know, have these places that, that people want to come to that are, are, you know, pristine or as close to pristine as you can be, right? Like using those as, ways to to fund and bolster conservation initiatives even you know w within our own country it doesn't have to necessarily be a reef system totally yeah i mean really you're just you need to look at that as a resource right and so it's like for indonesia that's a resource for canada that's a resource as well you think about what something like banff national park makes a year you know so we're yeah we've got a couple of really great examples but you're absolutely right is you know just look at it accordingly let the money draw uh, you know, let the people bring in the money, but then also you need to understand that maybe people do need to be mitigated a bit with their interactions because they will come and they will interact maybe negatively with the wildlife. But if you set a high standard, it'll be positive interactions and then it'll be preserved through time in a really nice way. Yeah, absolutely. I think people like when, when you, when people think, I don't know if you have this experience when you tell people that you're, you know, a marine biologist or however you describe yourself. I mean, there's, there's sort of the, the concepts and the ideas that come to mind initially for the people of the general public. And, and for me, it tends to be like, you know, the large charismatic megafauna or large animals, the killer whales, the dolphins, the porpoises, coral reefs, because yeah. they're sexy and they're topical. Um, but I, I, I wonder to what degree people on the island and in British Columbia know exactly what they have in their backyard. So you said you, you have at least a couple hundred dives on the island here. Um, and so do you, do you have a couple favorite sites and sort of, sort of what is your, your favorite thing or your, your favorite system in British Columbia uh, that we kind of have here? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, full stop, this is some of the greatest diving in the world. Like uh, my favorite place to dive largely is somewhere like Raja Ampet or right here on our coast. I enjoy it you know, as much as I do anywhere in the world. And it has its challenges. It's very Canadian in that it's rugged and it's cold and it's can be very unforgiving at times. But, you know, those just set up an element to it that kind of make it all that much more worth it, right? You don't have the tourist waves. You're never going to hop off a boat somewhere in Canada and there's going to be 250 divers in the water with you. You know, you're really sometimes very alone with your dive buddy, you know, climbing off some jagged rock somewhere and hopping in. It's a really surreal yeah, experience. wading into the abyss from the shore somewhere yeah. and nobody's behind you. <laughs> yeah, and it's like, you know, and it's big, it's booming, it's full of life. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think there are some really notable dives on the island that I've done. It's like, you know, 500 plus dives at this point locally. Um, you know, and we have some really good ones. Like, you know, I just was up on Hornby Island last week deploying a hydrophone for a friend's PhD project. And, you know, that area is known for the sea lions. And I think those dives, that might be one of the last true, like high octane dives left, I think that you can guarantee in the world, right? Like, you know, sharks are not doing good globally, unfortunately. And yet, and so people used to love these dives where you could hop in and you can dive with these big tiger sharks. And a few of those places still exist. Two hours away on Hornby Island, you can get in the water with 60 sea lions in five minutes, 
right? And that's yeah, insane. Yeah, these things are rolling off the rocks to see you. They do this thing where they like they tap on the top of your hood because they're really curious, and so they you like look up. And those are the canines and they're playing with the bubbles and you got like a grizzly skull above you and you're just like this is surreal I've seen a few of those wash up on the shore even just on the west coast trail and it like it looks like a like a oceanic siberian tiger like yeah. it's insane what what those things like look like and yeah the canines and the teeth on them it's yeah they're monsters yeah. and you know they're they're total puppy dogs they're like you know i remember the first time i did one of those dives you know i kind of like look back at the guy who's running the boat and i'm like this is safe right and like 50 60 of these things are rolling off the rocks towards me and he's like yep totally and i'm like <laughs> you're good see you never like whatever here we go um, yeah, so I mean, dives like that are really good, but honestly, right around Victoria, I dive 10 mile point, uh, which is by kind of Cadboro Bay with Tom Reimkin, one of the profs at UVic, um, like every week. And it's been a really great experience. Like it's just, you know, you hop in and you've got this lush kelp, great diversity, and you know, it's, it's a shore dive. Like we just, you know, what time's the tide? Okay, nine o'clock, see you there. We hop in and you know, a guy like that, he's been doing, I mean, he's got 500 dives at that site alone, right? right. So yeah. yeah, it's super accessible. You don't need to charter a vessel to get out anywhere. And, and I mean, like some of the sites here, like the color and the diversity that you see even just in temperate cold water is like astonishing. It's actually astonishing. Yeah. 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 I stopped like cold the other day at Ogden. I hadn't dove in in a while and like, I don't know, you're kind of just like, oh, it's the breakwater. Yeah, we can go in and get a dive. And I hopped in and like, you know, we just had this kelp cover and there's probably like 100, 150 black rockfish and some yellowtail rockfish schooling around me. And I just like, like just stood there, you know, and like the kelp changes the light underneath the water and it was just coming through perfectly. And I was like, this is you know, this is surreal in a lot of ways, yeah, right? Like about as close to spiritual as it gets. Right? Yeah, yeah. And you know, 10 seconds earlier, I'm just like standing on the blocks and I just like, you know, and I've got a hundred dives at Ogden. I was just like, and I just caught me and I was like, wow, this is, you know, this is really something. A little bit different system. We were at sea last summer on uh, a part of a collaborative expedition with the, the Haida First Nation and Ocean Networks Canada, Oceana Canada, which is a not-for-profit conservation initiative. And, um, Department of Fisheries and Oceans, and we were surveying these subsurface seamounts that lie, you know, at closest, like 80 kilometers off the shore. Cool. Here. Did you go to Bowie? Yeah, yeah. So we were at, so yeah, Bowie or Skon Kinglis, yeah. which is like right off of Haida Gwaii, which was like one of one of my favorite dives. And it's just, it's it's insane. And uh, so we, we, we would start at the base of these seamounts, which tower up from like 3,000 meters below the sea surface. And, and I don't know if you know about Bowie, but yeah, so that, so that seamount comes up to like 25 meters within the sea surface. And coming out of the last interglacial that that peak was actually exposed and so it was an island at some point and so it's it's woven very tightly into the into their mythology and and their culture and so it was super cool getting to dive there but even going to these places that are just like hot spots of biodiversity and i mean like i was up at like six o'clock every morning wasn't doing you know experiments or or subsampling until the rov came up but like i couldn't i couldn't miss any part of these dives it was yeah, absolutely that's, insane yeah that's such an incredible experience that place is like yeah, it's like, I mean, it's a well-known mecca of biodiversity, right? It's like this place of like, yeah, it really is this place of legend yeah. almost where it's like, oh, you got out to Bowie. Yeah, and we, ha we had the entire spectrum too and, and the scale. So the subsurface down to the, you know, below the photic zone. So it's it's pitch black. This ROV is cruising over the seafloor. But for the floodlights that are soaking the seafloor, like it's just absolutely pitch black. And the lights illuminate things and it's just vibrant with, with color and, and, and various animals, sponges and corals and stuff. And then... You'd like tap, take a step outside the, the control van and you'd have like humpback whales, like fin slapping like around the sea mount. You'd have like, you know, Pacific white sided dolphins ripping like on the bow. And yeah, yeah, so it's, yeah, super, super insane. This thing occurred to me while I was out there and that like, I mean, even myself being involved in the realm, like I, I had, I had no idea until we got out there. And like the, the cool thing about this expedition is that we were, we were, we were broadcasting live. So we were live streaming all our dives and we actually had a lot of engagement online and through social media. But it occurred to me that like, how, how do you get, how do you get people to care about these things and about conserving these things and protecting them if they don't understand or know they're there? Like, right. They can't, it's, it's, it's all subsurface, man. It's all, it's all, it's all hidden, but for, but for people that actually maybe by chance come across a live stream or, or, or some sort of documentary that, that kind of takes them below. So how do you, you know, the people in interior BC and Saskatchewan, how do you engage them? Yeah. I've started thinking about that a lot lately. Um, cause you're, you're totally right. And it's almost, I think we do something very unfair as scientists, which is 
we get mad when people don't rally to our causes and yet their days are busy, right? Like it's not like I have a lot of really great friends that I go back and hang out in the interior with and they're great people, right? And but their days are busy. And so if I can tell them like, look, the oceans are polluted or, you know, they're, you know, they're turning more acidic and corals are dying or kelps are dying or things like that. And then I want them to rally to my cause. It's not that they don't want to. It's like life is exhausting, right? And we just ask too much of them. And it's like, you know, you do this with, I mean, I do this with any kind of social thing that I feel very passionate about. You almost have this, you know, oh, you should rally to my cause. And I can understand that view because they should. If you're a moral person and you've done your homework, you probably have a view of this that someone else doesn't have. And hopefully you're correct in your thinking. But you ask a lot of someone when you say, you know, yeah, on top of your 40 or 50 hour work week while you're trying to pay your bills, maybe you have kids, you know, you should also spend some time thinking about ocean conservation. Yeah. You should really care about this deep water sponge yeah. that we just found. In the, yeah. yeah, by the way, we don't totally know what you should do, but like you should rally to the, co you know, it's like there's not, these are really complex problems. And so it's a really interesting thing that I think I'm trying to sort it out because I think it really is a fundamental issue in ecology and really in anything that you're motivated, you're motivated to try to fix in the world is, you know, you almost need to convert to the person's currency. Like you wouldn't go into another country, maybe you would in the modern world, unfortunately, and expect them to speak English and take your currency. So don't right. go to a conversation and say like, oh, I want you to talk in marine biology today. I want you to talk in ocean conservation. Say, what do you care about? You know, and I can, I've tried this out with some of my, uh, let's say like more right leaning redneck friends from the interior. And I mean, if your argument is so valid, you can have it in any form. You can talk about money when it comes to ocean conservation. Absolutely. These things are very valuable. So I really, I've been playing with that a bit because you're totally right. Is It's a really tough thing to do. And I think ultimately the way forwards is to talk to the people about the things that are important to them and see if what you're thinking about hits. Right. And if it doesn't, don't force it. There's 7.5 billion people in the world Go find someone else to talk to. It is, you know, the concerning and beautiful aspect about the ocean is that it, it is inextricably connected to to everyone, regardless of, of your location. Like we 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 depend on them so f fully for so many goods and services, food security, um, just the amount of carbon and heat that they absorb from our atmosphere alone is just astonishing, right? And so, yeah, like I, I like that, that getting, you know, talking in people's currency. So what do you care about, right? So your, con your concern is is the economy, then sure, I can we can talk yeah. in those terms. Let me tell you what fishing's worth. Let yeah. me tell you what, you know, any of these things. Yeah, you're totally right. It's like what, every second breath we take is from the ocean. You can probably find a common denominator with most people, but I've just, I've seen, and I've had people do it to me and I've, I really reflected on that, right? When you know, I have a lot of, you know, really well-intentioned friends and they'll come to me with their issue and it's not something that I'm passionate about. And I'm like, look, I'm here with you. I, I can see your view and I take it seriously and I want to help, but like I'm taxed out. Like I'm working 60 hours a week. You know, I'm a grad student. Like I've got a lot of work to do. And so I'm there with you, but unless you can like tell me what I need to do immediately, I can't really do just a rally to your cause in the long term. And most of these problems are so complex, there's very rarely an immediate thing that we could do that would just like band-aid the whole solution. You are looking for commitment. And so maybe in that, I was like, well, I'd, I'd like to be able to help these people more. And I was like, well, I just need to think about their problems as far as what they mean to me, like what they actually mean in my system. You know, you think about something like, if someone's really concerned with social instability, that's a, you know, my sister, uh, I have an older sister and she thinks a lot about social inequalities. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a very valuable thing to think about. It's not at all the system that I talk in, but we can definitely talk about what an instable global system is gonna do to ocean conservation. And I'll take that super seriously very quickly, right? And we can see this when, you know, people be, when systems become unstable or, you know, these kind of things kind of get unruly, obviously conservation seems to take a hit. Yeah. So, you know. In the climate right now, there there are, or the social climate, there are infinite things that you can be concerned about and that are, are valid points of concern and a very finite number of things that you can devote energy and your own concern to. And I think that's where where it becomes less of asking people to change behavior and to rally to your car, cause and more so finding ways to weave it in the fabric of our policy and, and you know, develop certain incentive structures that, that maybe people, 
people will operate on a on a level that's not at the very surface of consciousness where they're where they're actively saying I'm going to change a behavior because I really care about the ocean where it's just kind of like you know back to economic incentives where it's just like oh I really care about saving money and right and if that incentive helps the marine environment then it's simple things right which way are you going to vote how are you going to vote with your dollars and you know if people are moral and they're concerned about it you know hopefully you can have that conversation in a way that says look you know if the ocean goes we're in some pretty rough shape you know or if marine resources aren't managed appropriately then we're not going to have a fishing industry and you know and so these kind of things are I think are really valuable conversations but you're right you really have to be careful when you pick and choose you can't just constantly you know it's kind of like you can't just be constantly like uh, what is it like calling wolf you know like you can't yeah. just be like oh you know this is the big issue and scientists we need to be careful of this because there's a real uh, value to being an alarmist scientist in a lot of ways, right? If you're always calling like this thing's extreme or this thing's going to be, you know, the end of days. You, you get might, a lot of traction and attention. A and, lot of attention. Yeah. yeah. What it does, who knows? By and large too, what we have is a communication problem. Like even if you, if you, if you take the right message to people that are involved in the industry, like fishermen, right? Like the, if you look at the, the, the cod collapse on the East coast and the moratorium and, and how many people lost their jobs because cod was fished, you know, almost near extinction. And, and if you get these people to understand that, like, listen, we, we care about your livelihood here too. We want you to continue to be able to do this. And the only way to do that is to manage our resources effectively and to care about the environment. Otherwise it's, it's just, it's the same situation, right? Yeah. You fish down the food chain and then, and then you have, you know, thousands of people out of jobs. Yeah. Then we play blame game for like 40 years and yeah, yeah no one's still kind of resolved about it. Right. So. Yeah, exactly. You, you started out, uh, diving and in coral reef science is, is diving still a, a major component of what you do in terms of your research now? Yeah. Maybe. It kind of comes in waves. Um, so one of the big transitions that I made was into the bomb lab here at UVic. And so that was really, I would say when my coral reef ecology, uh, got brought to that kind of like, you know, front level. Um, so I started working with Julia and I went to Christmas Island three times, uh, over about a year. And so Christmas Island is a small atoll between Hawaii and Fiji. There's two Christmas islands, unfortunately. So, uh, when you go to Google it, but this one is in the Republic of Kiribati. And so I started doing, uh, these trips and that was kind of like really when I was like, okay, I've made it as a scientific diver. Now I ultimately, uh, didn't continue in Julie's lab, although I still, we still talk all the time about me going back to Christmas and I would really love to go. It's a super fascinating system. Um, but what that did for me was it kind of showed me you know, the reality of diving is it's really difficult. It's a great thing to do, but that program made it that no one could kind of take diving away from me again as a skill set. And I really think you should think about grad school as developing different skill sets. So at that point I'd had seven or 800 dives. I'd worked in, you know, a half dozen countries, uh, I'd worked here on the West coast, worked abroad. And, you know, ultimately I've been co-authored or I'm in the, love the papers are still in review, but, uh, I'm a co-author with one of the papers coming out of that project. And so it was, no one was ever going to take that away from me. And so I decided that at the graduate level, I should probably focus on other things. And so I took kind of a break from diving research, didn't incorporate it into my field work. I focused more on coastal ecology from the intertidal. So my thesis work looks at traditional and contemporary shellfish cultivation and the biodiversity responses to that. So on our coast, we have First Nations clam gardens that uh, have persisted for about 4,000 years, plus or minus, the dates are still largely being resolved. And uh, modern aquaculture, as it were, uh, came in about the early 1900s. These systems exist throughout our coast. And so I study the marine biodiversity. So basically all the critters, including the ones you're trying to cultivate, but the ones you kind of didn't think about or maybe didn't totally think about uh, the First Nation system thinks about many more species than our modern system does, uh, because many of those species are very valuable uh, culturally, uh, but also in terms of food sources as well. And so I do the biodiversity of that. So I've got 24 sites up the BC coast. Um, it's partnered with the Hakai Institute, which has been fantastic because it's been able to uh, take me to some very beautiful places, support the research really well. And so it hasn't been a part of my research until more recently, um, I've integrated it back in with other projects. So I recently took a fellowship with the Smithsonian, which is a really great opportunity. I went down and I spent the fall uh, jumping between Florida and Belize. And so that was a very dive related project. 
And then we've been doing a lot of acoustic work, looking at noise pollution across different kind of areas and also trying to get uh, recordings of fish noise and fish communications. And so that's been a lot of deployments of hydrophones and acoustic arrays and things like that. So I've started diving more now that I'm in the latter parts of my PhD. You probably feel this as well. There's like that part of your degree where you just like put your head down, learn everything you can, try to stay above it. And then like three years in, you kind of get to put your head up, look around and be like, okay, I'm going to get through this. What else do I want to do? Yeah, for sure. I still feel like I'm in the stage where my nose is buried, buried yeah. in literature for the most part. And yeah, trying to keep my head above water in terms of, of, yeah, just the steep learning curve of entering a new field. But yeah. Have you done your candidacy exam yet? No, it's coming up. Whoa. Yeah. How's like that going? De- December, January. So yeah, I still have to have the pre-candidacy meeting to like oh, set the bounds. That's a good one. Yeah. But yeah. I'm also like, I'm, I'm out to sea again on, well, I, a week from tomorrow, yeah. essentially. So yeah, back out to the Northeast Pacific for, so um, yeah, it's a busy, busy semester, but I've been shoving that to the back of my head for, yeah, put it on the back burner for, yeah, for, for I, sh- I put mine off yeah. a lot as well yeah. and I don't regret it at all. No. Um, no, cause it's a conversation in a lot of ways. Right. Yeah. And the more you have time to learn and think and interact with your system, the more you're going to get out of that. I'm a direct entry. So I have like direct entry into my PhD from undergrad after a work stint in the Bermuda Institute of Ocean Sciences. Cool. And, um, but yeah, similar thing. Like I, when I was down there, I was working my, my, my first term as a research uh, intern was working with coral reef ecology and I was looking at physiological responses to ocean acidification and, and temperature stress. And the uh, good news stuff. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Just really real feel good stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and then made the switch to, to microbial ecology and that is just like, it's an entirely different realm. And so it's one of those things too, that makes me realize that like, I, I don't know, when you're growing up, so many people are like, when I, when you tell them you do marine science, they're like, oh, I wanted to do that. Right. And I just, I've come to realize that marine biologist is kind of a misnomer. Like, yeah. you know, it just like, there, there's so, so many diverse aspects of what it means to study biology in the ocean. And you can, you know, you can do like, you know, animal ecology, you can, you can be, you know, study, you know, molecular ecology. And it's just like, yeah, it's, it just, it's much more niche than just like, I'm a marine biologist. And that's kind of like the buzzword that just people yeah. misunderstand by and large. Yeah. I only say that one when I'm talking to someone where I kind of don't want to sound snooty and I want to just kind of like keep the conversation going. Cause if I said like, I'm a near shore community ecologist. Be like, <laughs> yeah. You're a dick is what you are. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you're like, okay, that doesn't help anything. Why happen. are you using all your fancy book yeah, words? Yeah. What you use regular people words. Yeah. 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 <laughs> what do you, what do you, you think you're better than me? And I'm like, no, I think I'm probably broker than you. Like <laughs> almost certainly. Yeah. 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 yeah Bowl of rice for three days straight. That's, yeah. yeah. That's where we're at. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so you, you touched on a little bit about, about, um, your work in, in clam gardens and coastal ecosystems. And there was a, like maybe an interesting point there that I don't want to gloss over, but this sort of this intersection between maybe some facets of anthropology and, and sort of modern ecology as, as we currently understand it. And so you correct me if I'm wrong, there's aspects of your research that look at traditional aquaculture processes or, uh, throughout deeper time than, you know, our frame of reference now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so it's been the part that I found by far the most interesting of the work that I've done. Um, And, you know, again, with kind of you just don't understand these disciplines until you're truly in them. And I would know by no means consider myself really in that discipline. The people doing that work are, you know, they're anthropologists, they're archaeologists. It's a whole field of study, but I've been able to work, you know, quite closely with a lot of them and get just a look at the information is they're writing the key papers that I'm reading. They're really changing the way I think about coastal modifications through time, what it means to live on our coast, the history of our coast. We have such an odd view of what our coastal history is. You know, I, I think there's people that have a very accurate view, but I would say the, the kind of, yeah, I mean, whitewash would probably be the appropriate term. Like that kind of very whitewash version of your coastal history is is far from true right we're talking about large populations really complex resource management systems and far more consequences than we deal with in the modern world i really think there's something truly yeah it's, it's i mean it's interesting for lack of a better word something very interesting about a resource management system that evolved in a place where consequences were very serious right you think about shellfish and you know, what that means to have. So a clam garden basically would be, you can cultivate, you can cultivate it in various landscapes. And this could go from a great clam beach already that you build a garden wall on. Mm -hmm. So essentially you're building a large wall at the one meter 
give or take tide line. And what that does is it causes sediments to increase. It decreases the slope of the beach. It creates ideal clam habitat. Right. So, so what is the ideal clam habitat? Presumably they're looking for soft bottoms, something that they can yeah. burrow into. Yeah. Soft yeah. sediments, uh, sands. Um, the, one of the gardening practices is to like dig out your clams, which are going to aerate your soil. You're going to remove seaweed. So you're not getting anoxic zones. You might do some predator exclusion to make sure you're not losing, uh, any of your standing population. You could bring in clams as well. Um, you know, if you had say, let's say you'd built a clam beach, um, maybe you built it on a really great set, uh, a really great clam beach already and you just increased its productivity. That would be a really great option. But one of the things about this kind of governance, governance system in this land use is, well, not everybody has access to that kind of quality real estate, let's say. So you can also build it on these kind of, you know, let's say initially suboptimal clam beaches, but you could also build one on bedrock. And so there's some phenomenal clam gardens on the central coast where you kind of don't realize until you look at the shoreline and then you're on, you know, the central coast is really rugged. And so it's this rugged Canadian coastline. And then all of a sudden this beach, this garden kind of jets out from the side and you realize that someone built this on bedrock and then the sediments accumulated and they just created clam habitat from what would have been largely rocky intertidal. And so in that case, you know, you'd be pretty motivated to try to bring some clams over to get your population up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it has been really interesting to kind of expand my thinking about that and kind of see a lot of the cultural practices. And, you know, unfortunately, a lot of these gardens uh, became inactive due to colonization and largely residential schools in a big way. Um, residential schools were very targeted in the way that they were going about their cultural genocide. And because a lot of First Nations language is oral history, it doesn't take more than a few generations of cultural genocide before you can kind of maybe not, maybe not have the information or at least not have the stability in the system. And so it resulted in some of these systems not being as active as they once right. were. Clams have always been a really big part of First Nations culture. And a lot of these clam beaches uh, are still being harvested. But, you know, we're talking the Brighton Archipelago, you know, thousands of these things, right? right? Like we're talking a very vibrant food system. I find it fascinating just it, to think about in terms of traditional knowledge and the just understanding of the ecosystem that these people had. So uh, I think you had talked about some of these clam gardens going back uh, what, four thousand three, years. four thousand years, yeah. right? Yeah, and uh, I, so I find that fascinating. Just the the understanding of the ecosystem and how to manipulate it in a way that that you know increases productivity so that you support a larger population, right? Like it's Western sciences, we're very obsessed with it being conducted in a certain way, and I mean, you know, at minimum from a fisheries management standpoint, we are missing four, th like three or four thousand years of management practices on our coast. Right. Like if you think about your ability to persist through time as a society is somewhat influenced by the knowledge you've been able to occur in the past. Well, do you want 100 years, 120 years of like modern aquaculture or do you want 4000 years of lessons? Right. And so right. there's a lot of information there that, you know isn't even in the thinking of kind of the modern day system, right. unfortunately. When we think about, about human manipulations to the, to the natural environment and, and, you know, manipulating coastlines and agriculture, like it's, it's largely synonymous with disturbance, with perturbation, right? Like you're causing some sort of negative impact to the mm -hmm. ecosystem. I think in your paper, I read that like what, what you found here is that the, these traditional practices, these clam gardens actually can increase the biodiversity within the system, right? You, you, you end up with more species and a more complex ecological network than you would if, if it was left un, unchanged. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And I mean, there's, there's good reason behind this. I think you're, you're totally right though. We're kind of geared to think in terms of the negative, right? All human impact is bad. Like, you know, it just has to be that way for some reason. And I think that doesn't really give nature its credit, right? You're talking about life. Life's very complex. Species will take advantage of things if available. You know, whatever, there's that Jurassic Park line, like, you know, life will find a way, right? Yeah, and totally. it's like, you go into a system and let's say your coastline, and this is especially true with shellfish, right? If your coastline is these complex habitats, you're not modifying the whole coastline. It's not like we're trying to make the whole coastline into, you know, some shellfish farm, but you're making these kind of pockets and so if all the surrounding area looks the same way, but your shellfish farm or your clam garden looks differently, well, that supports a different types of, you know, biodiverse system and different species are going to take an advantage of that. And there certainly are some winners and losers, right? Some species don't really like clam habitat, but, you know, if your system looks a lot like the system that it used to look like throughout the coast, 
and you build a clam garden and you increase the structural complexity of the system and you increase the co- soil quality. And the same is true for modern shellfish farming. You know, you add complex landscapes and, you know, little things that species can hide under. It's not surprising that nature takes advantage of that. And I think it's really important because there are systems that species don't respond positively to. And so if our goal is long-term food stability, we need to be aware of what systems are having a negative impact and specifically what those impacts are, what systems are having a more positive impact, if you can say, you know, positive, and try to understand that is really important. Yeah, absolutely. An interesting point too, of just like the the term aquaculture can be a bit polarizing, right? Like there, there are associations that people make about the term aquaculture prior to having an understanding. I mean, aquaculture can refer to a bunch of things. In a sense, the, the clam gardens that you're talking about are, are about are a form of aquaculture, right? 100%. Um, and then there's, 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 you know, additional, you know, harmful practices. Like maybe you were talking about farming Atlantic salmon on the Pacific and, and the problems associated with that and with salmon escapes, but there, there's a spectrum there. There's, there's a range of, of practices, some obviously more harmful than others. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I think you're totally right. You know, shellfish aquaculture largely needs to get away from the term aquaculture because it is so polarized and rightly so fish farming on our issue is a highly contentious point it's you know you're talking about farming invasives we're not completely sure on escape potential there's a lot of evidence to say it's less of a risk than maybe we think there's a lot of evidence to say you know the oceans are changing and they're more susceptible to invasive species coming in and, you know, I don't know if you saw recently, there's this video where like blood is pouring out into the Pacific and it's, you test the, you know, what kind of concerns you might have with that. And there's all these viruses and these kind of systems that are these kind of things we need to be aware of. Shellfish farming is a completely different beast altogether, right? You're talking about cultivating the intertidal, you're, you know, largely just chucking out seed that you've grown and you're leaving it out there for a couple of years and then you're harvesting it. And, you know, the climate studies on this issue have indicated that if you're thinking about terms of protein, you're thinking about a really low carbon footprint protein. Um, And if you're thinking in terms of biodiversity so far, it doesn't seem to be the worst. And when you meet these people, right, I've worked with these farmers and they're incredible individuals, right? They're just farmers. They just want to farm. I have a friend of mine who's a young farmer and the idea that she's a 20 something year old, completely driven shellfish farmers with a master's and all she wants to do is have stable shellfish, you know, like she's not twisting her mustache trying to ruin the world. Yeah, for sure. Good person. Um, And I I think honestly, uh, having been in the industry for a little bit now and working closely with these people, it's a really unique paradigm in sciences that these people are open to collaboration, which is not normal when you think about food systems in a lot of ways. So I always try to, you know, equate this to people. If I said, to a beef farmer, I want to study how your system changes the biodiversity of the landscape. They would probably say, if you step on my land, I will shoot or sue you. You can choose. For sure. I think that there's a subtle difference there in that that industry is already under assault, right? There's elevated sort of apprehensiveness that is coming from, I mean, it is already very much a part of the political discussion in terms of how, what are the impacts on our climate. And so, mm-hmm. whereas I, I don't know if shellfish has the, I, I don't know, maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, has the same sort of um, the same sort of conversation going on in, in the public discourse. So they do get lumped in with aquaculture. Yeah. Yeah. True. And so as a result, there is a lot of dialogue surrounding that. Um, you know, they have concerns surrounding like plastic was one of the original, a lot of the original work on plastic in the ocean fo- focused on shellfish. A lot of people didn't even realize that the industry was trying to fund this research, right? They were interested themselves. And I think the thing that makes them unique relative to any other food system is they, uh, they're staring down some very serious scenarios and they need scientists help to get through them uh, effectively. So they have ocean acidification, they have, you know, largely unexplained die off sometimes, they have Viprio, they have microplastics, they have these things that are kind of threatening their industry. And it what, it's what makes them so easily uh, to easy to approach, right? Where if you said something to a cattle farmer, it would be okay, well, how do I make cattle bigger, right? And they're not, they're not, they're yet to reap the concern surrounding uh, like a lot of the impacts of the landscape and shellfish farmers live and die on those by unfortunately so, right? So every single one of them is going to tell you ocean acidification is a major issue, climate change, major issue, 
die-offs are a major issue. And so I think just having to deal with that, I've seen beaches pulled of nets and there was, you know, $100,000 of product and they had a die-off and it's, you know, it's gone. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. it's like akin to like what, you know, farmers in the prairies would, would have experienced due to a drought, right? Like this, it's massively consequential when these things happen. Absolutely. And I think the thing that's really important to think about is if you think about aquaculture, like farming Atlantic salmon, they have been, as far as I'm aware, far less open to that collaboration. And it's actually, I think, what has done them in in a lot of ways, right? If you don't have the public aware of your processes, you don't engage in research and you're not as uh, proactive in that. And I don't mean research in which you're doing your own research. I mean, like the Shellfish Growers Association, Garth, our mutual friend, they funded him to go find out how much microplastics is in shellfish. Right. Yeah. And they were actually super interested in what the number was. And if he gave them anything concrete that said like X, Y, and Z are the reason that there's plastic in your shellfish, next year, those would have been gone. They're going to adapt. Yeah. Right. And so, and they weren't like, it wasn't like they were like, oh, Garth, you have to say these things. Like they didn't, you know, they don't even like, I don't even know. They know that his studies are coming out. Like he sends them to them, but it's like, not like there's some sort of, you know, Luminati level interaction with these guys are just like, here's a hundred grand. Go tell us how much plastic are in shellfish and tell us how we can get rid of it. Yeah. And presumably like you're not coming in there with research funded by the Clam Aquaculture Society of Canada or whatever. Like, you know, it's not, it's, it, it sounds to me like it's research that you're doing just for the interest of determining what is happening in the system and what is the impact for humans and the industry. And that these people are just, are just, they, they want to know as well. They're, yeah. they're as interested in what's going on as you guys are. When well, they're a young industry, right? And so, you know, we have this idea that kind of industries industry should be evolving, right? And so the best way to do that is you just pay people that, you know, scientists will stay up till three in the morning for you thinking about your system and, you know, they'll drive all hours of the day to, you know, go do field work for you and things like this. And then they can give you information that says, okay, this is the way forwards, right? I'm writing this paper right now with these undergraduates who did a really great directed studies in Banfield. And, you know, they were interested in the planting angle of gooey duck and survivorship. The oyster, What's gooey duck? Uh, so gooey duck is one of the more profitable shellfish on our coast. Yeah. And so it's a really big shellfish, basically. And it's kind of got a small shell. You'll see them once in a while if you're swimming around. They tend to stick a big, large siphon out. Uh, there's a large Asian market for them. And so it's a very profitable industry. And these, these two young students were doing this project and they wanted to look at gooey duck. And so they went and talked to the hatchery guy and said like, you know, can we have a couple hundred little gooey duck seeds and, you know, maybe some ideas or whatever and see what we can do. And so they looked at planting angle and survivorship and just said, okay, well, is there any way we can increase survivorship to make it more effective? And the guy was like, great, go do it or whatever. And, you know, you talk to him now and he just took their findings and was like, great, like you guys found out something cool. I'll put that into use because this is a totally new industry. Like my goal is to be better Thanks. You know, like it's a really interesting place as a scientist where I feel like we struggle so much to have applicable results and, you know, usable findings in yeah. some of these systems. If you just look at the disconnect of what it, what the temporal separation is between being out in the field and collecting the data and, to, you know, to the point of, of publishing, right? Whereas like the farmer's kind of just going to look at you and be like, I don't care when this gets published in, yeah. in whatever journal. Like I, 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 yeah, I want to grow more gooey duck, please. Like, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. 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 Three years later, you get your pup, your first paper and you're like, I did it. And he's like, great. Yeah. You know, uh, it was a little long. <laughs> yeah, know? exactly. I gave you that money like in, you know, 2016. Yeah. yeah so, um, you talked a little bit about, about one of the aspects that you guys are looking at in, in the shellfish aquaculture or for, for lack of a better term, shellfish farming maybe, mm -hmm. uh, is, is microplastics, which is also a bit of a hot topic. And you guys just came out with a fairly, uh, fairly big paper that, that got a lot of traction in, in Canadian media and abroad, mm -hmm. uh, looking at, at human consumption of microplastics and maybe you can just give us a, a, a run through of, of what you guys were looking at exactly and how you did it and what you found. Yeah, totally. So yeah, that was a really interesting paper and it most certainly exploded up globally. Um, so yeah, what we were looking at is I always found it really interesting that you would go to these conferences and people would present on how much uh, microplastics are in the ocean or in the air or in any of these kind of, you know, natural systems. And people generally didn't seem all that perturbed by it. And yet, you know, uh, some of the early work where I was saying, okay, there's, you know, three pieces of microplastic in a shellfish, everyone got really up in arms about this. And as an ecologist, I found this really weird because like you can't have a huge amount of plastic in an environment 
that were the direct proprietors of without that plastic being in the things that we're taking from that environment. It seems intuitive. Yeah, yeah completely. Actually, maybe we could just quickly define for people that don't know what a microplastic totally. is. Yeah, yeah. yeah, uh, yeah. No, that's a really good point. Yeah, so a microplastic is anything that's made of plastic that's less than five millimeters is kind of the loose working definition. They get to microplastic status, if you could say that, one of two ways. They're made small, nurdles, micro beads, these kind of things that are made to be really tiny pieces of plastic. Those are primary microplastics. Secondary microplastics are breaking down. So these are things like the wear from your, unfortunately, tires have plastic in them. So plastic comes off your tire, enters a drain, goes into the ocean, or goes into another natural environment. Secondary microplastics. Fibers in clothes are really coming out as a major source of plastic. And we're talking to the point that like, what there's been some data that would show that a single load of laundry, say four or five kgs of laundry, is going to generate up to 17 million microfibers in that effluent. And depending on where you live in the world, like Victoria, we don't do a lot to treat our wastewater. And so a lot of that just goes right into your natural environments. And even if you do, you know, maybe you block it down and you make it into some solid and then it goes into your landfill and now you just have a lot of plastic sitting there. So really tough. Um, and so, yeah, so I was interested in the idea that these things are everywhere. And I noticed that a lot of the headlines were having this really interesting effect on people where they were just causing panic, right? You'd see plastic in salt. Oh my God, should I stop eating salt? And I'm like, well, that's probably not gonna happen anytime soon. And one of the things I think scientists always need to do is really push to give people the appropriate context to navigate the world you're trying to inform them on. It's really important. And if it's not done well, it can have serious consequences. You could accidentally tank the salt industry or something like this, right? For sure, yeah. You never know. And so, and people, you know, are not, again, with people being busy, right? Like you can't assume because I spend all day synthesizing information that the general public can do it. And so a lot of the people that I talked to were like, oh, we know kind of how much plastic people might be eating and we know some of the worst sources. And I was like, no, you know it. That does not mean the public knows it. And so I was really interested in this idea of getting full context. So allowing people to say this is a major source or this isn't a major source or things like that. And so I took all the data, well, Garth, Haley Davies, uh, John Dower, Sarah Dudas, and Francis Juanes and I took all the data we could find on this. Any item destined for human consumption that had the potential anyways, we took that study and those would be presented in concentrations. So maybe it's the amount of microplastics in our water. Maybe it's the amount of microplastics in our beer or our salt or our fish or our air and using data on how many of those things we're told we should be consuming. So something like the recommended water you and I should drink versus you know, a young boy versus you know, a female adult. You can look at the, basically you can get to the recommended consumption of microplastics. Items that aren't recommended for consumption, uh, so things like beer, we do have some data on that. You can find kind of a, well, you can find the actual consumption of those items. Bottled water, same thing, not recommended, but you can look at the average consumption of those. So we took that, did some fairly straightforward math, and we figured out how many microplastics you're consuming every year and every day. Yeah. So what is what does that number look like per annum for your standard North American adult? Yeah. So... It's pretty, uh, yeah, it's an interesting one. Um, so you're getting about, uh, it, it ranges, but you're getting about 30 to 50,000 microplastics. As we know so far, this data is very limited, i.e. it's an underestimate. You're getting about 30 to 50,000 microplastics a year from your food and your water. And you're getting another, you know, about equivalent that, if not more, so 60,000, let's say, from your air. And so... Just inhalation. Inhalation. Just, just, just breathing just it Just living. Yeah. We figure out how much microplastics in the air. There's been some great little studies telling me how much you're going to breathe in a day. I figure out how much you're breathing in. Yeah. And they're taken from you know, apartment buildings, office buildings, rooftops, subways. Uh, so, yeah. And so it's about 100... On the high end, it's about 120,000 plastics, 120,000 microplastics per year. Uh, and these obviously vary depending on what category you fall into. So, it, you know, the 10 year old version of me breathes less, should right. drink less water, these kind of things. The staggering part is we only have about 15% of your recommended caloric intake figured out. So 85% of the food pyramid 
we don't know anything about. Right. It seems like the ma- the majority of the data there is in seafood, right? And so like looking mm-hmm. looking at looking at those data, like you you have you have water, and I think you had honey in there. Yep. So and and sugars s- in general, sugars, salt, and then and then seafood, right? Yeah. And the entire the the rest of it is like there. Correct me if I'm wrong, but there's no data on you know what you're ingesting in like poultry or beef or yeah, or anything dairies else. vegetables vegetables yeah you even think about the kind of middle of the grocery store right those items that are really associated with plastic packaging you might find walk down the middle of your grocery store you won't be hard pressed to find an item that's wrapped in plastic individually there's a group of them in a bag and that bag is made of plastic right so you're talking about really a lot of the items done to date don't actually associate very closely with plastic right right except for things like plastic or bottled water so yeah you're totally right a lot of the caloric value we have Mm -hmm. is currently coming from seafood um and so again that was really important in current in terms of context because the research community needs to know what we do know and what we don't know yeah and so we the public needs to know as well yeah exactly but i mean so i think it was like it was really twofold right the people needed to know okay there's plastic and salt for sure Mm -hmm. you're only consuming depending on your diet let's say it's 2400 milligrams of salt a day so if there's like one piece of plastic in you know a couple of grams of salt should you really focus on trying to cut out that piece of plastic if there's a, you know, a hundred pieces of plastic you might consume by drinking, you know, water of some right. kind, right? So you needed, we needed to know what should people be focusing on. Yeah. The, the plastic problem seems like quite, quite poignant. It's like I mean, you go to a place like Costco, right? And they've, you know, industries have peeled an orange or cut a pineapple and then shoved it in plastic. And you're thinking like, well, if only, if only these things came with some sort of natural covering, right? Like, yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's a convenience thing, right? It's like, I don't want to peel my own orange. What do you think? Some sort of peasant? Totally. Yeah. And it's, you know, I mean, the thing we kind of, I think maybe don't think about is we've only really got started in our plastic production. Yeah. Like it's been exponential to date and it's just going up, you know, from here. Right. And so, you're right. It's it's largely a function of convenience, but the thing that's also important to remember is we're talking about one of the most like innovative materials made in human history. Certainly, right? So like, if you need a stint in your heart, I'm pretty glad there's this like malleable material that someone can make that goes in there and you know might last a hundred years. You know, so it, it does have a lot of great applications, but it's it's overuse, over integration into the system. Mm-hmm you know, plastic on plastic on plastic has really put us into this point. Yeah. And I mean, so even, even in context of, in the context of your study, you're, you're looking at like a, a North American diet. And I, I, I would assume, I don't know this, that the majority of studies from which you're drawing data from are, are centered in sort of a, a Western context. Right. And, and so even the, the numbers that you're citing sound, sound like, you know, quite concerning at a first glance, but then mm-hmm you realize that we're also operating from a point of privilege as well. Like you just go, go anywhere in the world that doesn't have the infrastructure to deal with a large, like a large point of, or a large part, part of these disposable plastics. And the, the, the problem has to be, has to be, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. So significantly the, more. the nice thing about this problem, uh, if you can say that is the data has been global more or less. Okay. <laughs> which has been great. So one of the things that's really unique is because so many countries, you're totally right, so many countries are facing this. There's phenomenal plastic work coming out of China. You know, the air, and that made it kind of tough because we were pulling in these global studies and then talking about the North American diet, which was where I was really interested in just presenting people with, here's your best guess of the density of plastic in salt or in honey or in seafood or in air or beer or bottled water, because then we did it all on the recommended. Most people don't eat the recommended diet, but what that allows you to do is to look at the items that you consume a lot of and make your own mind up about how much you might be consuming, right? It gives people a lot more freedom in navigating that data than me just saying like, full stop, this is the number, we don't know much, we need to know more. You know, it gives people the ability to navigate that. And, you know, yeah, if you're concerned about decreasing your plastic intake, we gave you some some ways forwards there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So what does your path forward look like? You are four, year, four years into your PhD yep. right now. And so are you... Are you, can you see the end of the tunnel yet? Or do you, do you have some things planned prior to, prior to leaving UVic? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, kind of the science standard, I need to, I, I need to publish a lot. Um, I have a lot of data. Um, I've been really fortunate. I think I've just landed myself in like the best research environment, someone of my kind of 
personality and uh, drive could have been in. Uh, Francis Juanes and Sarah Dudas, who I work with closely, who supervised my PhD, have been super supportive. And I'm a big fan of Francis. So yeah, really great, really guy. good dude, yeah. really great guy. And just you know that like that phenomenal like we we were geared to think that like a serious researcher has to be this like intimidating mean person to be brilliant. And Francis is, you know, supportive. He's there for his students. When we talk, he asks more about how I'm doing personally when we first meet. So it's a really great research environment. And so as a result, I've done fairly well as a researcher. I've been really fortunate uh, with the collaborations I've had, with the number of publications I've been able to get out to date. Um, you know, it's just really increasing. So I'll stay. I'm fully funded uh, and funded quite well. I've got an NSERC and then an internal fellowship as well. And then the first couple of years of my degree were uh, my Hackai Scholar funding. Um, and so I'll stay for at least another full year. Um, I have money beyond that, so I'll probably stay as well. And yeah, I mean, kind of the plan is like write up my Smithsonian fellowship, uh, and then finish writing up my uh, thesis work and then kind of see where that goes from there and then look kind of more to postdocs after that. Right. Are you looking to, to stay on the island? I know, I know you're, you know, encouraged to, to, jump, to leave. Yeah. Jump to far. jump shit. Yeah. Yeah. Or jump shit, jump ship. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So what are you, what are you thinking? Yeah, I got to go um, for sure. Um, so I, I love the island. It's ultimately where I'd love to work. You know, if I could stay here, that would be fantastic. But the best bet for me staying here is going away. And I'm in Canada in general. I love our research environment. I think we have a really nice balance of, you know, fun, available funding. We don't have the, and I've, I've done a, you know, a couple of things now in the States and like a, that research is amazing, right? The American system, like love or hate Americans, they know how to throw money around, right? They fund research, they get in there. For sure. And so there's some advantages there, but I just don't, for me, think that's where I could end up as a researcher. I really, like, I am a Canadian kid in a lot of ways. I just love, love Canada. So, yeah, I'll go away. Um, I think I might try to go find another similar-sized island, though. I've been looking a lot at the idea of Tasmania as my next, like, my next <laughs> yeah. jump. Uh, About as far away as you can get. Yeah, yeah, yeah it yeah. meets that criteria. It's like, all right, get out of Dodge, go yeah. to Tas. <laughs> yeah. um, and yeah, I, I met some really cool people from the University of Tasmania when I was working with the Smithsonian. And you just talk to these people and, you know, there's some of them are diving in like white shark territory and like, just, I mean, like, you think the West Coast is rugged, like, we'll probably figure it out. So, um, yeah, so I think I'll, I'll go away for sure. I'm still, yeah, about a year out of applying for postdocs. Um, but yeah, I'd try to go away, maybe Australia um, as well, and then kind of do that thing, right? It's, it's tough with the research, though, because the timelines are so unfriendly, right? It's like... Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you know, it's I don't know where you're at. Like, you're, what, year three? Uh, just started year three, so yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm staring yeah. down the cannon here. I've got quite a bit left to, yeah. Yeah, right? So it's like, okay, do the PhD. Maybe that's five years, five and a half. Do a postdoc, that's a year, maybe two. Then do another one. And like, I'm like, how long? Yeah, how long do you keep this up if you want to kind of chase that professor dream? But Yeah, absolutely. It is, there, there's that added element of uncertainty that just is, yeah, it's, you don't you don't have it in other professional programs. Like if you're in school, you're in law school, there's no, you know, security in that sense in that you know if you if you do if you do well and do the stuff that that uh you, yeah. you're going to be a lawyer at the end of it there's yeah that 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 uncertainty that's just like what like five percent of of phd graduates end up with faculty positions and it's hyper competitive and yeah yeah people end up doing like you know eight years of postdocs chasing down that dream and it's totally yeah i like that that number so interesting though right because it's like i know like so many people i know and i think we have to do this in research is like we have to stop seeing things as hierarchical so it's like the faculty, it's not the faculty position and then everything else. Totally. Right. Yeah. And we, we do this where yeah. we're almost trained to think that way. Right. It's like you get there day one of your PhD and someone's like, have you thought about your postdoc? Are you going to go for tenure? Where do you want to do your, you know, and you're like, got to jump if you want to be competitive. And you're just like, you're telling me to move across the world and I don't even know your last name. Yeah. Like, why are we doing this? Where a lot of people I know, Sarah, my other supervisor works at DFO and, you know, she loves it. It's a great job. And it wasn't like she failed and ended up at DFO. Like she was meant no, to absolutely. be there. Yeah. So yeah. So I think it's like, it's such an interesting thing where you're right though. It's so competitive. Like, you know, you need to yeah be publishing multiple times a year, get out, win lots of money. And so, yeah, we'll see where it goes anyways, but it's uh yeah, it's a kicker timeline. Yeah, absolutely. 
Cool. Well, uh, you've, you've obviously done quite well for yourself in, in the time that you've been at UVic and, and in graduate school. So do you, do you have, as we wrap up here, any mm-hmm. advice for up and coming scientists, up and coming marine biologists that, that want to, to get into the industry? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I totally do. So yeah, I think I got very lucky in grad school, which is not something you can bank on. And I think for young people, really in anything, right, it's just like, show up, do your homework right? Like learn. There's nothing more powerful than like someone who knows what they're talking about and admits when they don't know what they're talking about at the undergraduate level or at any level, right? There's like, you talk to really smart people and they don't hide if they don't know something because they want to learn it. And if you have that information, they will like learn it and compute it and put it into them right away, right? So I think that's it is like, you know, do your homework, be ready and just be keen and like, you know, take advantage of those opportunities. Like you're eventually going to get saturated, our generation, especially like too many opportunities. Everybody wants to like create their own job and like be really aggressive. But then it's like, we're working 60 hour weeks and burning out. So learn when you're on the back, the end of that, the tail end of that. But when you're in your undergrad, like, yeah, be active, be keen. I didn't, I started diving and then it was like, I applied for a job. I didn't even, I applied to volunteer in the bomb lab. She, Julia asked for my resume and my transcript and all these things. And I sent in this CV that had like 400 dives on it. It was like all I'd been doing. And she's like looking for divers. And she's like, okay, you're ready. Like, let's get going. And I didn't see that coming. I was just like, I want to be a diver. I want to, you know, I was taking the right classes and taking that stuff seriously. And so for kids, it's like, I meet undergrads all the time that ultimately I end up publishing with and I end up doing, you know, projects with. And if they're like, keen and there and willing and honest about who they are and what their strengths and what their weaknesses are like you're never going to fault that person right you're just going to want the best for them so i think yeah just being willing to put yourself in that and you know open some doors yeah i guess there's also an aspect of of grad school that it it it, it's a slog right like it's it's a massive time and energy commitment and so do you do you have any secrets for how you how you keep head above water there how you how you achieve some semblance of work-life balance and, and yeah, how you navigate the space of being a PhD student. Yeah, totally. So I think one of the things that really came out for me was I really started to realize like you are joking if you don't think you're a product of your support system, right? And I very much like most young people, let's just go with me. I very much did not think that I was a product directly of that support system. I thought I was doing a lot of it on my own, and that's not the case like at all i've realized that in grad school because you're totally right like you're you know if you're crushing it you're working really hard you're being very calculated you're doing all these things and then i started realizing like wow i'm really just a function of the great people that are supporting me and be can be your parents or your friends and like i've been so lucky with the people that i've connected with in grad school right like like garth you know like such a good guy for me to be working with and we have such different personalities but we like have just cultivated this system where we work together we support each other want nothing but what's best for each other and you know we're both better because of it the same is true with my partner and so i don't think you need there's not a recipe to what your support system has to be but like find it, appreciate it and like cultivate it because that's actually what you're there for, right? Like no one wins, gets a big win and like doesn't just immediately call someone from their support system. For sure. So that system's gone. Like you're not going to struggle for those wins the same. And so, yeah, I think that was one that really hit kind of like when grad school hit and I was like, whoa, this is a lot. And you, you know, you find the people that you can kind of talk to openly, you can tell them the truth and they like, you know, won't beat you up for it. So yeah, that's been definitely the best way forwards for me. And I think for everyone I've seen that's done well. Right on, man. Cool. Well, I think that's a good spot to, to wrap this thing up. Do you, uh, do you have, uh, any, uh, you know, online forums where people can can follow your work and and get a hold of you. Yeah, totally. Yeah, so I have uh, I mean all the standards. So I have Twitter. It's like K C uh, Kieran C X, um, but it's just under Kieran Cox. Uh, I've got a website. Uh, same thing. Basically, if you Google my name, like Kieran Cox, you're Vic, all over the place. Yeah, especially now with all the media, it's like you're gonna get yeah. three hundred different uh, articles on me. So. Yeah, some of which have my photo, so that's great. Right um, on. Yeah. Cool. Good deal. All right, thanks for joining us, man. Yeah, no hey, We'll see you for coffee next week. Yeah, good deal. Thank you for listening to the Veracity Podcast. If you enjoyed the last hour or so of your life and you want to support us, you can subscribe, comment, or share on whatever platform you like. If you're interested in sitting down and having a chat with us, you can visit theveracitypodcast.com, scroll down to the contact section, and drop us a line. Cheers. Cheers.